morning. And our reading over this last, if you've been reading along with us, and I certainly hope you have, there's reading charts on both of the welcome displays, there's wooden, uh, uh, wooden podiums that are out there in the hallways on the north side and the south side. There's all kinds of information, uh, there's literature and information, Bible reading charts, but one of those charts uh, is a yellow chart, and it has January and February and March on it, and it has a daily reading schedule, and that daily reading schedule Follows on as we're reading through the New Testament. You say, Pastor, I forgot. I, I wasn't here in January. I didn't start with you. That's okay. Grab one, start today. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians. Yesterday we read 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 and 3. And uh, yeah, today we're in 4 and 5 and 6. And so just jump in. Amen. Jump in. We're about halfway through the New Testament. You can jump in halfway through. Listen, there's no wrong way to read the Bible. There's no bad time uh, to, to start reading the Bible. If you didn't read or haven't been reading, start today. Now our Bible reading today uh, is in 1 Corinthians, was actually I'm sorry 3 and 4 and 5 and, uh, and so as we're in this chapter we're reading through this and I, and I hope that you've been reading along. We, we come to this verse in 1 Corinthians in chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. If you found that, why don't you stand with me this morning just out of reverence and respect for God's word as we honor the word of God and the, the word that God has given us We come to this very important, very challenging two verses, verse 1 and verse 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2. Notice with me what the Bible says here, what God is saying to us. He says, so he says, let a man so account of us as the, what's that, read that phrase with me church, Uh, as the ministers of Christ. Now minister is a servant. He said, if you want to know who we are and what we are, we're servants of Jesus. Some of you this morning would say, Pastor, that's my heart. I want to be a servant of Jesus. Would you raise your hand this morning? Amen. Praise God. I'm preaching to you. We're preaching to each other this morning. He says, not only ministers of Christ, but and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, a steward is a caretaker. Somebody has something very valuable, something very important, and they've given it to somebody else to take care of. How many of you guys have ever had somebody give you something to take care of? Maybe you watch their house while they're on vacation or take care of their children, their dog. How many of you guys have somebody, somebody's entrusted something to you, all right? It's very, it's been a responsibility. That's what God calls us. Now notice with me in verse 2, God says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found. What's that last word, church? Faithful. Faithful. I'll preach a message this morning from these passages, uh, for chapters 3 and 4, on this subject, simple subject. Yes, it matters. Yes, it matters. Let's pray this morning. Let's ask for God's help. Father, we thank you that you are here amongst us, Lord. You promised, Lord, that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And Father, we thank you for the blessed word of God. And we thank you for the wonderful spirit, the sweet spirit of God. And Lord, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. Father, I pray, dear Lord, that all that we do and all that we say would, would be pleasing and glorifying as you are in our midst today in a special way. And Lord, that's what makes the church so special because you're special and you're here. Father, I pray that you would help us as we, Lord, as we walk through the scriptures this morning, that you'd bless us, Lord, and you'd help us in Jesus' name. And amen. You may be seated this morning. Now, if I were to say, so obviously we're in the, what book are we in, church? We're in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians in the Bible. We're in the letters of, what we call the letters of the epistles of Paul. And now, if I were to say, if I were to say uh, New York, all right, the city of New York, what state is that in? That's in the state of New York. If I were to say Miami, what's the, the, that's in the state of Florida, exactly. And so you have an idea of, when I say a state, you have a, a general idea of where and location and something about it. But sometimes when you, when you identify Bible places like Corinth, nothing, it's just like fuzz, right? It's just all just, you're like, I have no idea. So Brother Chris, if you'll bring up the next slide, please. And so one of the things that's helpful uh, as, as God gives us geography in the Bible, all right, it's one of the reasons why there are maps in the back of your Bible, not just so you can go there when you get bored with the preacher's message, all right? And so, but there are maps in the back of your Bible, there's concordances online, and so when God gives us a location, he's trying to give us a pin or a point and and some different information so that we can have a bigger picture, right? 
So when they, in the, the city of Corinth, as God's writing through the Apostle Paul, this letter here to the, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians, because there was two, um, so, in, uh, so Corinth is, an, is a little island, or is, a, uh, is actually a part, is a city on a, a, a KI in the, in, the, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a part of the city, uh, country of Greece. So it's in the Mediterranean Sea. It's, it's a part of the country of Greece. So oh, okay, it's, it's a Greek country. It's, it's actually a city. Uh, Brother Chris, go to the next slide, please. And uh, there's a little bit of a zoom in. You can kind of see it was a port city right there. And then go to the next one. All right. So one of the next things is one of the interesting things is to get a picture. Brother, if you'll zoom in on that, just right in the center there. And so archaeology, zoom out just a little bit. That's a little close. All right. We don't want to read what they're having, uh, see what they're having for breakfast. Zoom out one, one bit there. Thank you. And so as the archaeologists have uh, recreated the city of Corinth, it was a port city. It was an affluent city. It was right there on the Mediterranean Sea. And, and it was a, a typical Roman architecture in the first century. It was walled and it had a, a forum and it had a, uh, it had a theater, amphitheater, where they would meet. All the different things that a, that a modern first class technology it had running water, just like we have running water. They had hot water. They had cold water. And all kinds of uh, things that we think, oh, well, they invented that in the 1800s. Listen, the Romans were way ahead of us in a lot. They had paved streets. Now listen, I've walked on streets that the Romans paved with cobblestones just several years ago. I don't think MDOT's got anything on the Roman engineers. And, uh, but this is kind of a picture of what Corinth uh, looked like. And, and so as you study the Bible and as you study history, what you find is that Corinth was a, a wealthy city. Uh, it was a city of tradesmen right there on the coast of the Mediterranean Ocean. It had skilled tradesmen. And so it was an affluential, it was an influential city. And it was also a city of affluence. And so it's a little bit about that. Now you think about that. The, the, the church in Corinth was made up of the people of Corinth. And the people of Corinth came from the city of Corinth, right? And so the church, and by and large, was a reflection of the people. Uh, do you notice, how many guys have ever visited a church in a different state? Ever visited a church in a different state? Ever find it it's a little weird? All right, a little weird. You're like, wow, these are a little, little different. All right, I'm sure when people come to visit Rose Park Baptist Church and they come to visit us for the first time in Holland, Michigan, they're like, oh, those people were a little weird. It's a little different. It just didn't feel like home. Listen, because every church is made up of the people of that area and every area is different. But if you take time to read the, 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 the letter of 1 Corinthians, you find out that the, the, the church at Corinth, the believer at Corinth, that there was a lot of influential people. Influential people in the city, very affluent people, very, uh, very wealthy people. Uh, and so they were a gifted church. They were a gifted church financially. They were a gifted church spiritually. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, listen, you guys, you don't come behind any other church in any spiritual gift. They were a church where God was working and God was moving and things were happening. They were making an impact on their city. That's all the good. All right. There's always, but there's always two sides to every coin, right? There's always the good side and there's always the bad side. And one of the things, thank you, Brother Chris, you can just go off of that. There was the downside to the city of Corinth. There was a downside to the, to the church at Corinth. Uh, see, while they enjoyed a lot of good things, they had a lot of problems, they had a lot of struggles. Uh, first of all, they were a bickering church. They were knitting, picking, fighting, and uh, they were kind of campy. You know, they, they're like, well, we followed the Apostle Paul. Oh, yeah, well, well we followed the Apostle Peter. All right, some guys were like, well, that's okay. We, 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 we're disciples of Apollos, all right? And so Paul had, God, through the inspiration of Paul, had to address this. This is a long letter, what we call 16 chapters, all right? This is one long letter. But first of all, the Apostle Paul had to address some bickering and fighting and, and some divisions that were in the church. And I don't know if you've ever been to a church where there's picking and fighting and divisions. It's not fun, is it? It's not good. It's not godly. It's not spiritual. And God addresses that in there. And, and then they had to... They had, some, they had a lot of misunderstandings of grace. How I many you guys read chapter 5 this morning? Anybody read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning? And you, if it's the first time you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you were like, oh, that was going on in the church? I mean, I mean that, stuff, that, that stuff goes on on like, you know, tabloid TV, all right? And they had some stuff going on there. And you say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, you go read first. It's in your Bible. Been there 2,000 years. You go read it, all right? I'm not going to tell you. But they had a lot of problems where they were misunderstanding grace. They thought, well, the more we're involved in sin, and it doesn't matter what we do, because, because whatever we do, God loves us and God forgives us. And they were, they were abusing God's grace. 
And so now we get up to chapter 3 and chapter 4. Understand this. Understand when, when the Bible was written, when God was inspiring the authors of the Bible, there was not chapters and verses. Now thank God there's chapters and verses because if I said in your Bibles, open, the, open to 1 Corinthians and find in the place where it says, let a man so account of it. And there were no chapters and there was no verses. We'd all be looking down through here and we'd be, we'd be going page after page after page. So the chapters and the verses are very nice divisions and they help us find things. But one thing that chapter and verses kind of do for us that were not intended was it, it brings up sometimes a wall of division. So when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're like, oh, this is the content in this chapter. And sometimes it will introduce a, an unnecessary or an imagined division. So the, the passage we're in, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the, the passage is actually chapter 3 and chapter 4 combined together. Because chapter 5 starts a whole new subject. So in these two chapters, and then right in the middle, the Apostle Paul says, hey, hey, you want to know, you want to put your focus, hey, church, let's put our focus way back, back where our focus belongs. He says, you know what it comes down to? He says, listen, if we're, you're saved this morning, if you're, if you're a child of God, then there are two primary things that ought to highlight or ought to represent your life. And that is this, number one, you and I ought to recognize that we're servants of Jesus. You and I, listen, we're in the family of faith, and we're in the army of the Lord, and listen, we are servants of Jesus. You want to transform your Christian life? Well, first of all, listen, first of all, you have to have a Christian life to, to transform it, right? And so one of the things I want to, we're pointing out here is as you read 1 Corinthians, and you're thinking, man, are these people even saved? I mean, they had bad attitudes, and they certainly got bad morals, and they got some bad beliefs in there, but they were saved people. You know, saved people can do bad things. Do you know saved people can believe bad things? That's why we're supposed to get in the Bible. That's why we're supposed to come to church. He says, listen, let's get our focus back where it belongs. Number one, let's get our focus back on serving Christ. And number two, let's get our focus back on the fact that, listen, everything God's given you and the wonderful opportunity that God has entrusted to you, it matters. Now, I've given you a little bit of an introduction. With all of that in mind, join me back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, so, he says, let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Now look at verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found. What was that verse? What's that word again, church? Faithful. Faithful. See, God has entrusted to us, the Bible calls them the mysteries of God. In other places in the New Testament, that mystery of God is identified as the, the wonderful truths of God. Is summarized even further, the gospel of God, the message of salvation, number one, and then more broadly, all of the truth of God. Listen, you, did any of you write the Bible this morning? Did any of you write the Bible? No, none of us wrote the Bible, did we? Somebody, somewhere along the way, listen, how many of you have personally met Jesus? No, none of us has personally met Jesus. Someone told you about Jesus, and then someone gave you a Bible and somewhere along the way, you realized you were a sinner. You needed to be saved. You recognized that Jesus died and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. You decided, man, that's the greatest deal I've ever heard. You repent of your sins. You tell God you're sorry. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. And listen, you become what the Bible calls a Christian. You're a believer. And then they give you a Bible for you to grow and know and listen, begin to invest your life. But here's the truth sometimes that we forget. God has given us such wonderful gifts. Can anybody say amen right there? Amen. How many think it's a wonderful gift to be saved? Say amen. amen. How many think it's a wonderful treasure to have the very words of God in our hands? Amen. amen. It's a wonderful treasure. It's a wonderful treasure to have a family of faith. It's a wonderful gift to have a church. Amen. It's a wonderful gift to have Christian friends. It's a wonderful gift to have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us to lead us and guide us and to reprove us and to teach us in all things. God has given us so many wonderful gifts. So listen, can I just tell you this? That maybe it's never dawned on you. Maybe it's never occurred to you. But you and I have been entrusted with great riches. Great riches. I don't have my wallet on me. I always unchuck everything out of my pockets when I come into church. And, and, uh, but listen, I could pull out my wallet. And then that wallet, of course, has a driver's license and credit cards and IDs and all those different things. And it represents the, listen, the financial and identity of who I am. 
You know we're blessed, aren't we? Amen. We're blessed. We have great opportunities, great, great resources that have been given to us. And we're supposed to take care of that, right? The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to steward those things and be responsible. But can I tell you this, church? There's something far greater that we're responsible for. You see that car that I drive? One day it's going to be in the junkyard. It'll be a pop can probably eventually, all right? Listen, the house that I live in one day will eventually, listen, listen, if it's not in this life where it crumbles down, and I don't know if you've ever had every house my wife and I, or the first house my wife and I had, we poured all our money, time, and I love that little Cape Cod in Ravenna, Ohio. And listen, it, it, it ended up, we sold it, and then the next two people didn't take care of it. It looks terrible, all right? You want to go back and say, what are you doing? I fixed this thing up. Man, take care of it. Listen, God has given us wonderful, rich things. It matters to God what we're doing with it. It matters to God. And because it matters to God, it should matter to us. The Bible says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You see, God cares about his kingdom God cares about his children. God cares about his church. And can I say, God cares about the lost men and women out beyond the four walls of this church who are waiting for someone to steward the gospel to them. We all said this morning, just a few minutes ago, hey, pastor, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad somebody shared with me the gospel. I'm sad, glad somebody was faithful and kept the lights on and, and listen, kept the church going and so that I could get saved. We all said, man, I'm so grateful. We are grateful. Are we grateful enough to be responsible? Now, in our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4 is this passage encompasses. God gives us several things that matter. I want you to notice with me, we're simply going to walk expositorily through these two chapters. Just briefly this morning, I'm going to identify each of these sections to you. But if we're to take a look at this section, this section is the matter, the, the fact that, listen, we're servants of Christ and we're stewards of God and it matters. So what are some of the things that matter to God and that should matter to us. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in verse 1. He says, And brethren, I could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Young Christians, immature Christians, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto or up till now you're not able to bear it. Neither are you now able. And then God gives us a carnality test. I say, Pastor, is he talking to me? Am I carnal? Look at verse 3. He says, For are you not yet carnal? For is there is among you envying? And strife, which is fighting and bickering and arguing and, and gossiping and, and divisions. Are you not carnal and, and walk as men? Number one, in, in verses one through four, four, God identifies to us that our spiritual maturity matters. Our spiritual maturity matters. It matters to God. It matters to others that you and I decide, as Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 1, that you, we as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Now, see, we take, we take maturity for granted here. We do. Because we're, we, we, have, we enjoy such a, uh, a blessings. We take the fact that nourishment and, and nutrition, listen, when a baby is born, we just take for granted in America that that baby's going to get the love, the nutrition, uh, the input, the care, and that baby's going to grow up. We just take it for granted. Listen, we take it for granted because of the rich blessings of God, but understand, all over the world, it's not like that. It historically is not like that. Understand, if you were to walk through the pages of time, in fact, if you walk through many cities across the world, uh, there, there is a great malnourishment. And the lack of those essential elements of nutrition and, and, and care. And, and those children, you see stunted people. People who had, were born with all the potential like you and I. But they lacked the necessary elements of growth. See, we take it for granted. And we take for granted that, well, I got saved. I got saved a year ago. I got saved five years ago. I got saved ten years ago. I got saved 50 years ago. We just assume that we grow up spiritually, not realizing, listen... As God would put on, listen, glasses, his glasses, his eyes, or if we put on the, the ability to see like God sees, you know what God would see? God would see stunted people. Christians who are born into the family of faith that, listen, have never grown up 
spiritually. They've never taken the time, listen, to feast on the word of God and go from the milk of the word of God and to the meat of the word of God to feed themselves. Listen, it's the shepherd's job to lead. It's the job of the sheep to feed. And it's my job, listen, to break the word of God down and teach it to you. But listen, friend, if you only eat one time a week, you're going to be weak, right? We eat every day. It's your responsibility, just like it's my responsibility to feed myself seven days a week physically and also seven days a week spiritually. Number one, can I just point out to you, Christian, your spiritual maturity, which by the way resides mostly and by and large on the responsibility of yourself to grow up in the Lord, matters to God, it matters to your spouse, it matters to your children, and it matters to your church. And by the way, it matters to your world because immature Christians never reach the plateau or the place of spiritual service. That matters to God. Now continue on, look with me in verse 5, continue to read in the section. He says, now, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord to every man. He says, I planted an Apollos water, but God gave the increase. The second thing that God points out in our passage here is our, our spiritual sowing and cooperation matter. Our spiritual sowing. God, uh, the Lord uses an agricultural picture. He said, listen, you and I would say we're like farmers, we're like planters, and we're planting the gospel seed, and we're planting spiritual seeds of growth. And he says, listen, somebody comes along and plants, and another person comes along and waters, and we're working together. He said, listen, it's not the, 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 the important part isn't who's doing the planting and who's doing the water, because one guy says, well, I'm putting the seeds in, so I'm important. And the other guy was like, well, I'm, I'm watering the seeds you put in, so I'm important. And Paul said, listen, you're both important, but you know who's really important? God's important. You know what's important to God as a church? Not only that you and I are individually doing our part, but we're working together in a spirit of cooperation. It matters to God, listen, that I'm doing my part. And it matters to God that you're doing your part. You know why? Because God is willing to do his part. But God's not going to do my part. And God's not going to do your part. God's going to do his part. So it matters to God that you and I are spiritually sowing those seeds and spiritually cooperating together. Now what happens when we do that? Go down with me. Continue reading in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, according uh, to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Now the Lord uh, shifts and instead of an agriculture picture, now we're using an industrial picture, a picture of building a house. He says, I have laid the foundation, another buildeth thereon, but look here, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation of a spiritual relationship with God than a relationship through Jesus Christ. Now, if, notice that word, if, if any men build upon this foundation gold and silver and precious stones or wood or hay or stubble, Now notice here in verse 13, every man, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try or examine every man's work of what sort it is. We're talking about judgment day. The third thing that the Lord points out to us in this passage is that our spiritual soundness matters. God contrasts two types of building materials of our spiritual life. Things that are good, things that are last, things that are durable, things that are spiritual, things that will, that things that will last through, listen, the holy fire of God's judgment day. And also contrasting with three things, wood, hay, and stubble, that will not last. Fleshly, carnal, temporal, worldly things. Spiritual soundness matters to God. You know why? Because God loves you. How many of you have someone here that you love? Raise your hand. You love them. When you love someone, you want the best for them, right? When you love someone, you want what's best for them. You see their future. Can I say, by the way, teenagers, young people in here today, the reason why your mom and dad guide you and direct you and correct you is because they love you and they want what's best for you and they can see a little bit farther than you. And they want you. They want the best for you. Can I say this? God wants the best for us. And God, you know what God sees ahead? that so many times that we, we don't pay attention to? Judgment day. Standing at the judgment seat of Christ. 
The day, listen, that everything that since I become a Christian, since you become a Christian, the day that, listen, that it's all brought out, there's a spiritual substance to everything that we do. And listen, it's all going to be brought out. And God says there's a holy fire that's going to be put to that. And only what is done, how, what was done, how it was done, and why it's done is going to be evaluated. It's a whole different message. But listen, friend, spiritual soundness matters. There's going to be some Christians that built a solid Christian life. They served God. They did it the right thing for the right reason, the right way. And listen, they're going to have a wonderful reward in heaven. Do you know why God has to wipe away some tears? How many think it's going to be great to go to heaven? Say amen. I mean, it's great to go to heaven. So why are there tears in heaven? Because there's going to be some Christians, listen, who didn't build spiritually soundly. They live for themselves. They live for the present. They live for the world. And listen, they spent their entire life building with things that do not last for eternity. And that angel is going to strike that heavenly match and put it to everything that you've ever done, said, or did. Listen, and the only thing that's going to be left is a smoldering pile of ash on heaven's floor. And this is my sanctified imagination. Here comes the Zamboni. Dee, dee, dee. Like the little thing at Sam's Club. It's going to suck it all up. You're going to be sitting there with empty pockets and empty hands looking at Jesus. That's why there's going to be tears in heaven. Spiritual soundness matters. Let's hasten through the text this morning as we continue reading on. Notice with me, and as we now bridge the chapter from chapter, from chapter 3 to chapter, uh, uh, I'm sorry, from chapter, I'm sorry, not, not quite yet. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. We'll, we'll see the next thing that God points out to us. He says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that's your body, and that, ye are the, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple are ye. The next thing that God points out to us here in our passage is this, that matters to God is our sanctification. Our sanctification, that is living a clean life in an unclean world. We live in a world that's, that is filthier and filthier, not just physically, but spiritually and morally. Listen, our morals matter to God. And God makes a great point of that throughout the rest of the book of 1 Corinthians. Now notice with me, as we see the fifth thing, still in chapter 3, notice with me as we continue reading on, look at verse 16. In verse 16 he says, no, I'm sorry, not in, in verse 16. Uh, look what he, in verse 18, I apologize, verse 18. God says, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, for it is written he had taken the wise in their own craftiness. And, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. The fifth thing that God points out to us in our passage here this morning that God says is important is our spiritual perception. You see, there were believers in Corinth and said, well, you know, uh, if it wasn't for me, this church wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for me, this ministry would collapse. You know, if it wasn't for me, this ministry wouldn't be funded. And listen, there were some folks that thought that they were very influential and very significant in the work of God and they were self-deceived. And so God says, listen, let no man deceive himself. Understand that we need to look at ourselves how God sees ourselves. You know what the problem is? Too often we walk through the fun house of the world and we, we go in a little fun house with all the little distorted mirrors. And those of you that have a few extra pounds, you like the little mirror that makes you real skinny. All right. And those that are a little skinny like, like to go to the mirror, it makes them look a little buff, right? And the ones that are a little short like to go to the mirror, it makes them look real tall. And the problem is we, we like to go through the world's fun house and we like to look at ourselves and make ourselves look good. No, friend, listen, the Bible says we need to look in the, what the Bible calls the perfect law of liberty. And we need to see ourselves how God sees ourselves. Spiritual perception matters. God says, listen, what a sad day when we deceive ourselves. Now... As we bridge over from chapter 3 to chapter 4, there's just several things, just a few things left. The next thing is we, of course, read in our text this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, spiritual accountability matters. Spiritual accountability. 
Recognizing, listen, that I'm personally responsible to God for my spiritual life. I think some folks have this idea that when they get to judgment day, you guys are going to stand there as a family. And, and you know, whoever the spiritual leader of the house is going to step forward. And uh, maybe the husband kind of shoes the wife forward. Or the wife shoes the husband forward. Or the kids decide to kind of get behind mom and dad. It's not going to be that way. It's not going to be like me saying, hey, I, I, hi, Lord. And oh, we're the pole fools. And, you know, Tawny, yeah, I'm going to put Tawny out on the Tawny talk for us. It's not going to happen that way. Tawny's not going to step back and say, Lord, you know, here's, here's, here's Rob and, 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 and put me forward and say, hey, you know, he was the head of our home. And I, by the way, I am and I'm responsible for my home. But I'm responsible for my life and Tawny's responsible for her life. Friend, listen, if you're only serving God when other people are watching you, there's another level. It's a level of living in the presence of God. Spiritual accountability matters, but let's hasten this morning. As we move through our text, that's verses 1 and 2. I'll pick up our reading in verse 6. You see the second of the last thing. This is the longest passage, by the way, from verse 6 to verse 13 in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Notice with me what the Bible says here. It says, but these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to the Apollos for your sakes. Then you may learn it, that in us not to think above men, uh, above that which is written, that no, no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For, for what maketh thee to differ from another? Or what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as this thou had not received it? The next thing that God points out to us in verse 6 through verse 13 that matters is is spiritual humility. Spiritual humility. Understanding, listen, we're all sinners saved by grace. Listen, we're all, we're all a work of God's redemptive grace and pro- progress. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Listen, we all fall short of the glory of God. And except for the grace of God, listen, we'd all be lost and undone. But spiritual humility among family members, among husbands and wives, amongst Amongst kids, teens, and adults, amongst, listen, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, spiritual humility, recognizing, listen, none of us are better than the other. None of us, listen, have more favor with God. Spiritual humility matters to God. Now look at the last thing. This is so significant today. In verses 14 through verse 21, we see the last section of this passage These eight things that matter to God and should matter to us. But notice with me, and this one is so important for today. He says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons to I warn you. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus have I begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, that's Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Lastly, number eight, the eighth thing that this passage points out is that our spiritual influences matter. Those that influence us matter. Young people, can I just have you look up here for a moment? We live in the age of influencers. YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, all those different things. And there are voices that are trying to influence you. They're, they're trying to speak into your life. They're trying to decide what you look like and how you dress and how you think and what you do with your life. Understand, every, every influence has an impact on you. They have an agenda. They have a motive. They have morals. And by the way, it's not just for young people. Listen, Fox, CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, they all have an agenda as well. I'm an equal opportunity discriminator when it comes to worldly media. Understand that influences matter. Who you are listening to is who you will become. Their spirit will be your spirit. Their morals will be your morals. Their manners will be your manners. It matters to God and it matters to us 
who we allow to influence us. Choose your influences very wisely. Let me do this this morning. Let's bow for prayer. Father, as we bring this message to a conclusion, Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us through the Word of God today. And God, you have given to us clear information. Lord, as you were speaking, Lord, to the believers in Corinth 2,000 years ago, and yet, Lord, it is as fresh as the morning edition today. Lord, thank you for inspired truth that never ages and is always relevant. Lord, I pray today that, Father, you would speak to us and, God, that your Spirit would guide us into the truth of these things. Lord, I pray if there's one here this morning that is has never begun a relationship with you. They've never come to the cross. They've never repented of their sins. They've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that today would be that day. They would begin their spiritual new life and a spiritual journey of walking with you. It only starts with faith in Christ. Father, I believe as Christians, Lord, we, Lord, we travel through this life. We pilgrimage through this life far too casually. Lord, we allow the world to set our agenda and determine our priorities. And so, Father, I pray you'd forgive us for that. Father, I pray and ask, oh God, you'd help us to understand it matters. It matters to you, and therefore, it matters to us. Lord, I pray as you've spoken to us through your scriptures, Lord, if there is one or two or all eight of these areas, dear Lord, that, that we need to be concerned about. Lord, I pray if your spirit has spoken to our hearts today about these matters, Lord, I pray that we would take this time, this time that's set apart to respond to you on the message. And Lord, I pray that we would do that. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning to our feet as the instrument.